Good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Brown, and on behalf of the entire Beyond Clean team, we want to welcome you to the first ever Beyond Clean virtual conference. This has been a week filled with sterile processing energy, with the Beyond Clean SPX 2020 Virtual Vendor Expo just wrapping up. And now today, this virtual auditorium is filled with students and nurses and surge techs and sterile processing techs, healthcare leaders, vendor manufacturers, infection preventionists, program directors, I could go on, all in the name of fighting dirty together in an effort to move forward in both passion and progress. Throughout the conference, we encourage you to engage with all of the different tools that you see on your screen right now. Your conference view is customizable to you. So while the presentations are happening, please feel free to submit a question for the speakers through the question and answer widget. Um, there's a resources widget that will provide you some downloadable tools and links from the companies supporting this conference, like Beyond Clean. Um, CCI and 3M. When you have a particular aha moment throughout today or throughout each individual session, we encourage you to share it through your social media channels and tag Beyond Clean. We will be right here next to you all day long <laughs> absorbing the incredible information that will be shared throughout the day. All sessions from today's conference will be available on demand, so we encourage you to join us for the entire conference, but also we understand that some of you are tuning in when you can while you're at work or taking care of your family. Uh, not to worry, because you will have access to all of this great content even after the conference is over. Finally, I want to say thank you to the Competency and Credentialing Institute, or CCI, for their persistent creativity in partnership with Beyond Clean. And thank you to our generous conference sponsor, 3M. There's a tool on your screen that looks like a little hand, and if you click on that anytime throughout the day, you can watch a video message and a new product announcement from the 3M sterilization team, so be sure you check that out. With that, good morning to all of you, and I'd like to turn it over to our first featured speaker, CEO of the Competency and Credentialing Institute, Dr. Jim Stabinski. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. So, uh, good morning from Denver, Colorado. It's quite early this morning, and if you're joining us from the West Coast, it is really early, so thank you for taking the time out of your day to engage in some additional learning, continuous professional development, and I would like to thank Beyond Clean. We are a partner of Beyond Clean. This has been a very impressive conference, and in these extraordinary times, Beyond Clean has done a tremendous job here to meet the educational needs of a wide variety of healthcare disciplines that work in the operating room. I'm Jim Stabinski. I'm the CEO of CCI, the Competency and Credentialing Institute, and we are the nonprofit based in Denver, Colorado, that does certification for nurses that work in the operating room. I want to talk this morning about five trends in American healthcare. There are certainly no shortage of things to talk about, trends, megatrends, things that are happening in American healthcare. I want to single out five of them that are particularly pertinent to a wide variety of disciplines that are working in the operating room. So this is a little bit of my background. I have been with CCI for just about 10 years now. Prior to that, I managed operating rooms and supervise central processing departments. And I've been a nurse for over 35 years. My background, I'm originally trained as a diploma nurse. And my training was done at Toledo Hospital School of Nursing. And I'm the last male graduate before that school closed. So that influences how I look at education and training and how the different disciplines come together in the operating room. I have been the CEO of CCI for about a little over three years now, and I'm also an adjunct professor, and I teach graduate students and doctoral candidates, nurses, in fields like healthcare finance and healthcare policy, 
And you'll, that kind of seeps through as I present. For any CCI presenter, because we are accredited to deliver certifications, we do have to show you this disclaimer. So this just basically says there's no special advantage on our exams or you don't get a special break on recertification if you're a nurse. If you listen to a CCI presenter, to including Jim, um, no special advantage there, but we do have to tell you that whenever we present. These are our objectives for this morning. I don't like to read slides to you. I'm not going to read the objectives. I want to talk to you about big trends happening in American healthcare, and it's centered really in how we deliver surgery in America. I want to talk about how the disciplines come together. That's a big theme of this conference. When we present with Beyond Clean, we have all the healthcare disciplines that work in the operating room. We're all in these classes, these sessions together. So today you can have instructors, presenters from industry, from beyond clean, um, central processing professionals, surgeons, nurses, all of us will be presenting. So I want to talk about these changes going on in American healthcare and talk to you about how people enter the various professions in the operating room. And I will talk to you about both nursing and central processing. So the first trend, I want to talk to you about the complexity of American healthcare. None of this should be a surprise to you. Americans in general highly value technology and knowing, we like to brag that we have the best healthcare, the most modern surgical care in the world. I would say that generally that's true. Nobody has more technology. Um, nobody uses more technology in healthcare than the United States. And uh, this is part of how we market. We highly prize this American healthcare, and we like to be the best in healthcare. It's it's kind of the bragging rights uh, in the world about the nature of our healthcare system. It seems a new piece of equipment, a new tray of instruments shows up every week in the operating room, and we are the people that have to work with that equipment clean it, decontaminate it, get it back into the operating room, and make sure that surgery goes well. If there's one piece of equipment that epitomizes the complexity of American healthcare, it would be this. I think many of you probably recognize this piece of equipment. This is called the Da Vinci robot. If you're working in central processing, or if you're a surgical tech or nurse, that works at a facility with this robot, this really does bring to the forefront how complex American healthcare is. The use of robots and intuitive surgical, the Da Vinci is just one example of a robot. There's many of them out there. But when we classify healthcare facilities and the complexity of the care that they deliver, we look at a number of things. Do they do robotic surgery? Do they do transplant surgery? Do they do cardiac surgery? These are the measures of how complex healthcare is. If you have instrumentation and equipment like this in your operating room, these are incredibly complex and you have to develop new skills to work with this type of equipment. So credit here to Intuitive Surgical. This is taken right from their website, a picture of the Da Vinci robot. Another example of the complexity of American healthcare, let's talk about total joints. I've been in the operating room for 35 years. I trained in a diploma school in Toledo, Ohio. And when I first started in the operating room, things like, um, laparoscopic surgery 
arthroscopic surgery and using video cameras were relatively new. Now, and at that time, if you did total joints, they were an open procedure, and no matter the procedure, whether a hip or a knee, you had an extended hospitalization after that surgery. We are now routinely, for knees, we're doing knees as outpatient surgery. Now, that takes a considerable amount of work to screen the patient, set up the instrumentation. Often there's a robot involved, some sort of surgical assistant, but this can be done for many patients on an outpatient basis. You can do a hip, if you do an anterior approach, you can do that and have an overnight hospital stay. So this, again, is another example of the complexity of American healthcare. And then finally, duodenoscopes. Now, not everybody deals with flexible endoscopes, but many of us do. And uh, we actually have a certification devoted exclusively to the processing of endoscopes. This is another example. These are incredibly complex pieces of equipment which requires special skill to process. If you don't get this right, you can have problems with infection control. But this is one more example. These are incredibly expensive. This scope is tens of thousands of dollars. They can be relatively easily damaged if you don't handle them well. And there's some risk in using them if you're not familiar on how to clean them properly. So what is this, what, how does this play out in the operating room? All of this technology enables us to deliver safe, efficient care and deliver excellent care to our patients but it requires a sophisticated and a well-educated workforce that works together well. New skill sets are required. When we talk about doing robotic surgery, all of the people that are involved, the surgeons, the nurses, the people that process the instruments that plug into their robots, all of those people need additional training. These are not the sorts of things a nurse would have learned 35 years ago in a diploma school as when I trained, because these things didn't exist at that time. So new skills are required, and there's a need for lifelong learning. If you're going to keep up with the pace of change and all of this technology, you will need to engage in lifelong learning. The second trend is there are increased expectations from the people that consume our care. The relationship between the patient and their family and having surgery has changed over the years. It continues to evolve. This, in the big general heading, this is healthcare consumerism. There are many, there are many patients that we're going to encounter in the operating room that do not have insurance. They have a significant financial burden for their care. Even if they do have insurance, it is very common that they're going to have a high copay just to access care, even if they are insured and even with the best of the current health insurance plans, they have a big financial stake in their health care and their expectations are high. So um, we have to meet those expectations and licensing certification is all part of that obviously certification is part of what we do at cci and the education for people that work in the operating room but licensing licensing and certification happens changes in those um, fields happen as a response to changing expectation of lawmakers, the consumers of care, they are setting a higher standard and then licensing certification requirements change in response to that. In general, when we talk about certification and licensure, they are now talking about terms like competency, maintenance of competency. This is not just a paperwork 
drill. These are integral parts of licensure and certification processes, and those expectations are changing. At CCI, we are very involved in certification um, for nursing, and in the larger picture, in the whole certification and credentialing industry, especially in volunteer service with their accreditation bodies. They are now talking state boards of nursing, uh, the people that regulate healthcare, accreditation agencies like Joint Commission, they are using the term competency. This is the actual performance. There's a distinction here. Competency is the actual performance in a situation. That's when you integrate knowledge, skills, attitudes, ability, judgment, and you actually perform. Previously, when we dealt with certification and licensure, it was, it, especially with certification, it was a matter of passing an exam and then doing continuing education to maintain that credential and keep those initials after your name. That is changing. So now accreditation agencies are setting a much different standard, and they ask us to address competency. That is a much different thing than just having a record system to ensure that you do your continuing education. Why is competency important, and why are regulatory bodies, accreditation agencies, why are they so concerned with it? There's a number of reasons that it's important to ensure competency. It's really a hallmark of a profession. If nursing, central processing, surgical technologists, if we want to be considered as a profession, these are the sorts of things we have to attend to, that as a profession, we ensure the competency of all of the people that are members of our profession. It protects the public, it advances our respective professions, and when we talk about healthcare consumerism, it meets the expectations of the consumer. It also decreases the liability of the profession. So I would just like to check in. I do see a comment, and I want to ensure that my audio is good. So right now, I've checked my audio. If anyone in the audience, if you can give us feedback and type in in the comment section, if the audio is good or if we need to do anything to address that. So I'm gonna pause for just a second, give you a moment to type in, and I will pay special attention to the audio portion as we go forward. All right, so I have about 35, 40 minutes of content. We have one full hour for this session. So there's gonna be ample time for questions afterwards. I'll cover the materials. If you do have a question, just go ahead and answer it into the chat line. If there's anything that's especially pertinent on a given slide, we can go back to that slide. So keep your notes, enter your questions. We have a moderator, Lisa of the CCI staff and Lindsay of the Beyond Clean staff are helping us out. And so keep those questions coming in. So in the bigger picture, the operating room is the economic engine of the hospital and we generate anywhere, depending on the facility, between 40, 60, 70% of all the revenue that comes into a facility is somehow connected to surgery and how we can bill for that. In this, the current picture and the trends that are going on in American healthcare, the actions of one staff member, this could be the person that cleans and turns over the operating room, the person that cleans and processes the instrument, the nurse that's working in the room that opens up the sterile supplies, the surgeon, any of those people, if their competency isn't what it needs to be, that can impact 
the reimbursement for that facility in in the the other trends that I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to explain how that happens. So we're the largest revenue center for the hospital, but we're also the largest cost center. And the way reimbursement is changing, the competency of one staff member can affect that reimbursement. So let's talk about the third trend because all of these things come together. and Let's talk briefly about education levels for American healthcare workers. Let's first look at nursing. So there was a program, and this sprung from the IOM report on the future of nursing, the Institute of Medicine, and this came out about 10 years ago. And it was called the 8020 Initiative. And the goal, and this is a very lofty, ambitious goal, that 80% of the American nursing workforce, and that is over 3 million nurses, that 80% of those nurses would be educated at the BSN level or higher. We are currently at 64%, and that is steadily rising. There was a survey done about five years ago about hiring practices for nurses in the United States. It was done by the American Association of the Colleges of Nursing, and they reported that almost 46% of facilities that employ nurses require nurses to have a BSN level education to be employed. Also in that study, 89% said that they had a strong preference for BSN hiring, and that is a, a momentous change in American healthcare. When I graduated from a diploma school about 35 years ago, about 20, 15 to 20 percent of all nurses were diploma school graduates. Uh, there were a significant number of associate degree graduates, and then a smaller group of BSN graduates. Now the diploma schools are almost extinct. Only about 2% of all people entering the profession are diploma graduates, and it's about evenly split the balance between ADs and uh, baccalaureate graduates. But more significantly, in response to employer preference, nurses that graduate now with an associate degree or diploma are being urged, mandated, pushed to go back to school to quickly earn a BSN. We have about 3.2 million nurses practicing in the United States, and about 100,000 of those are in a um, RN to BSN program to complete their BSN. And about 30 to 40,000 nurses graduate from these programs every year, and about 50 to 60,000 nurses take the NCLEX to enter the profession in their BSN. So the makeup of the BSN workforce is rapidly changing. The, um, so we will not reach the 80% mark. We won't reach that in the year 2020 but the percentage of nurses that are holding a BSN or higher, that is steadily increasing. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. What does that mean for central processing? I think there are parallels here. So if we look back 60, 70 years ago, the vast majority of nurses educated in the United States received a diploma or a certificate upon completion of their training, and they took an entrance exam, it's now called the NCLEX, to enter the profession. Now, the, uh, there are very few diploma grads, and you actually get a degree, and then you go on to take the NCLEX, and then you quickly get pushed to go back and get um, you're quickly pushed to go back to get your BSN. So um, I do see the comments. So 
on my audio, I have just, I'm working for my iPhone. This is the nature these days of um, doing conferencing remote. So do let us know if that doesn't work. But basically, I've just placed my phone down and I'm holding it steady. So let me know if there are any issues with audio. So let's look at the parallels between RN education, surgical technologists, and central processing. Central processing today, there are a diversity of programs for you to take to enter the profession. When I first came in the, into perioperative nursing, many of the people that worked in central processing simply engaged in on-the-job training of various time periods, and then and then you were um, you just started work. And so Lindsay has asked me to put on my headset. Give me just a moment. I'm going to put that on. Lindsay, could I get an audio check? Does that work better? And I'll check the comments box here. Yes, you're significantly more clear. Thanks, Jim. Okay. All right. So this is testing my flexibility in being a presenter, but um, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for the feedback from the audience. So now the game has changed. For both surgical technologists and central processing, just as it's changing for nurses, for sterile processing, there's now a wide variety of schools available. There's commercial schools, there's courses given at community colleges, and there are a number of options. So there's still on-the-job training. However, there are many more options, and what we're also seeing is that uh, there are some programs, and here's an example on your screen, that are combining the certificate of completion of the, the diploma that's given when you finish your education and your training course, and you can go on and combine that then and earn an associate degree with an emphasis in sterile processing. These sorts of programs are now becoming more common. There's a parallel here. Surgical technologist, now, it's very common that to enter the profession, they have an associate degree. This, I think, will follow the same sort of development course that we saw with nurses decades ago, that you began with diploma or certificate of completion programs, and then we transitioned to higher levels of education. This is a trend in all of American healthcare, no matter who no matter which profession, successively higher levels of education to meet the ex expectation of licensing, regulatory, and accreditation bodies. So surgical techs, it is not a coincidence that many surgical techs now hold at least an associate degree. That happens to be the um, tree path into nursing, for many RNs, that's not a coincidence. So if you want to legitimize, substantiate your profession, you up the education level and you pay more attention to certification. This is a general trend in all of American healthcare. So now let's talk about the fourth big trend. And I'd like to emphasize not we emphasize that all of these trends have common elements and they, there's an interplay here among these trends. And the fourth trend is changes in care models and how, how uh, care is reimbursed. And let's emphasize surgical care. So I live in a suburb of Denver, Colorado. 
This is a picture of a, a healthcare facility close to my home, about 10 or 15 minutes away. So this is a micro hospital. So we are seeing a, a redistribution of how healthcare is delivered. And this thing about micro hospitals, this facility I believe has 20 or 24 beds. It has operating rooms. I believe it has an endoscopy suite, but they do a tremendous amount of ambulatory care at the facility. So all of these terms that you see on your screen right now, ERAS is Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Pathways. ACO is Accountable Care Organizations. What's a common element for all of these micro hospitals in these terms? When I trained 35 years ago, none of these terms existed. This is the nature of American healthcare. It's getting more complex, and how we deliver it, and how we reimburse it, reimburse that care, specifically surgery, is changing. So, for many years, surgery was a very straightforward business, especially if you were managing surgery. So surgeons were independent contractors, and you wanted to bring them to your hospital. You wanted to have them do cases with you, but you had to cater to their needs, their whims and desires in order for this whole system to work. Surgeons were the captain of the ship, and what they said, that ruled. There was a very simple equation if you managed an operating room. You would, um, if you managed an operating room, you needed to find the cases that had a good um, reimbursement and a good um, return on investment. They had a good margin. Find those cases, and those are things typically like spine and ortho that involve the implant. Find surgeons who wanted to work at your facility and push all the volume that you could. We also believed in things like there's an inherent risk in surgery and infections will happen. If you have surgery, a certain percentage of people are going to develop an infection and that was just part of the nature of having surgery. So this is changing. In 2016, about one half of all physicians were now employed by hospitals or healthcare systems. So they are employees of the, the facility just as we are. Generally, surgical technologists, nurses, central processing staff, we're employees of the facility. Now, increasingly, I would bet in 2020, more than half of all physicians are employed by hospitals. So that relationship has changed. And literally, we all have to work together to meet expectations quality and to meet reimbursement guidelines. The new game, we are dealing with things like bundled payments and accountable care organizations. So instead of billing for every part that went into the surgery, the implants, uh, the nursing care, the surgical care, the anesthesia, the amount of time in the operating room, now insurers and reimbursement uh, the people that give us our reimbursement, they're negotiating and saying, we'll give you one payment for an episode of care, and they're going to negotiate the price. We don't get to just say, we spent this much, and we want you to reimburse us. They are saying, if we're going to do total needs and we're going to bring our business to your facility, we're going to negotiate a price. We will give you a set amount of money and you have to deliver that care efficiently, and you'll pay the surgeon, the anesthesia provider, and all of your staff, you'll pay for your implants and your supplies. All of that comes with one price, and figure out how to do that efficiently. There's increasing documentation requirements, obviously, when you deal with care like this, and overall, the amount that we can bill, um, the reimbursement is not as rich, robust, as it was at one time. And 
you have to make this all work, you have to invest in technology like robots, um, Da Vinci's. If you're going to do total joints, increasingly robots are used. So you have to make these investments and figure out how to do this efficiently. This is a whole different environment. Those people that reimburse us for their care, they are saying if you develop complications, we may not reimburse you for that care. If you develop a surgical site infection and it wasn't inspect expected, that's not a normal sequela for that care, they say that we won't reimburse you for the additional care. So we have to work together, all the disciplines together, to do this efficiently and safely. So there are financial disincentives from the reimbursement um, entities, the insurers, groups like CMS, and they're saying you have to deliver care safely and do it well. All of this rolls up to a thing called value-based purchasing. And this is the single biggest, most disruptive thing in American healthcare is the transition to value-based care. So this is being driven by CMS, Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they set the rules. And they're saying you have to document and report your quality, your customer satisfaction, are the patients satisfied with their care, and your reimbursement is tied in some measure to this. So you report, CMS determines how well you're doing compared to other facilities, and that dictates part of your reimbursement. While they do say there's incentives to deliver care of high quality, there's also financial disincentives if you don't adapt and do this well. So this is a, a more detailed value-based purchasing and value-based care, but the point is, if you don't deliver care of high quality and you have high patient satisfaction, you will receive less money from your insurers. This can have big consequences. So you have to meet the consumer expectation, the regulatory expectation for quality. If you don't, you can get 1% or 2% less reimbursement to your facility for the surgical care that you deliver. That can amount to millions of dollars. And in healthcare, where uh, margins for care are small, that can make all the difference between a facility being able to stay in business. Many facilities, especially smaller, unaffiliated facilities, and not part of a bigger system, have struggled with this, and some have gone bankrupt. And so, we are losing 20 to 30 hospitals a year in the United States, mainly small rural facilities that are closing down. And they're being replaced by inventory centers, micro hospitals, uh, critical access hospitals. But if you can't adapt in this environment, this is a sequela to that. You may go out of business. So, this all probably seems pretty daunting, and you're listening to Jim Chalk and saying, oh, my gosh, how do we deal with all of this? So I like to, um, to get kind of a level set here, and I think about how have people dealt with this in other industries. If you remember Lee Iacocca, he was faced with a tremendous challenge, and how was he going to save Chrysler Corporation, as it was called then? in the middle of a tremendous challenge. And he said, we are continually faced by great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems. So this whole thing about how do we react to these trends and what do we do personally, uh, we believe um, there's a path forward. So you're probably asking yourself, is Jim gonna get to the payoff here? And where do we go from here? CCI thinks that this, all of these trends come together and they present new opportunities and give us opportunities for new partnerships. That's part of why we work together with Beyond Clean 
and we work in this intra-professional environment, we think there are opportunities here. So what can you do on a personal basis? What can your facility do? What about your department? Let me offer you some suggestions here. We think interdisciplinary education like this venue, where we bring central processing, nursing, surgeons, anesthesia providers, central processing professionals, we all come together and we learn together. We think there are value, there's value there. We participate, we sponsor, and we are, we're actively engaged because we think this has value. We think that the healthcare professions who work in the operating room, we think collectively you should support and advocate for increasing education levels across the professions. And CCI is actively engaged in advocacy for that. We think we just have to commit all of the professions in the OR to continuous professional development over the course of a career that we're gonna engage in lifelong learning. On a personal level, we think people that work in the operating room need to take personal responsibility for their competency, not just their knowledge and do they have the potential to perform that they can consistently demonstrate competency. It's just part of how you do business and that um, your responsibility, this safely, consistently over time. We think certification is part of the solution here. For those people who are certified and for central processing, there are states that require you to be certified to work. It's a, it's a employment requirement. We think that's a good thing. Certification keeps you professionally engaged. It compels you to engage in ongoing education. If you want to keep that credential, we think that's a good thing. We do think that certification entities like CCI can do more to help certificates. And part of that is um, doing more research. And so just briefly, CCI believes this should be a priority and we are actually putting money and resources into this. We have our own research foundation, and one of our big interests is studying this, this relationship between education levels of healthcare professionals, certification and recertification mechanisms, and patient outcomes, because ultimately, it's about delivering safe quality care and we study and report on these relationships, and we have an active research agenda on these topics. So here, here's the summary. We believe all of these trends come together, and they compel us to work together to deliver high quality care, to maximize our reimbursement, and to decrease the financial disincentives to cut it into that revenue. So we also have a partnership with a blues musician, and this is CCI, and his name is Walter Trout. So if you have a social media device, uh, a web-enabled device, look him up. He's been very good to us at CCI. He allows us to use this music, but look him up on the internet, and he has an album called We're All In This Together. That's kind of the theme when we began to work with Beyond Clean. All the professions are in this together, and um, that's part of the lyrics in this song. It's a great song. When we do live presentations, this is actually the walkout music when I begin to speak. And I do the opening presentation and cover this theme. All of the professions who work in the operating room, we're all in this together to deliver safe patient care, to fight dirty. Um, we're in this together. That's the theme. I hope that you found this information about trends happening in the operating room. I hope you found this helpful. And at this point, this concludes my material.
and we're going to open it up for questions. And thank you, and now we'll take questions. And I think we have about 12, 15 minutes. So, Lindsay, Lisa, what do we have? Yes, Jim, thank you so much for that information. The first question that came through for you is, should sterile processing techs wear N95 masks when cleaning COVID-19 patient surgical instruments? So I knew that we were going to get to COVID-19 questions. I knew it was coming. I will tell you that Jim is not an infection control specialist. There is guidance out there from the CDC about this. I think in general, any common sense precaution that we can take when we're processing instruments, it is far better to be cautious and take time to attend to this. And if that means um, being very careful about uh, wearing masks, et cetera, these seem like safe, common sense, and um, good evidence-based practices. But ultimately, you know, how we do this, there is good guidance from groups like ISHAM and AORN here. To the best of my knowledge, wearing an N95 mask, if they're available, seems like a very good and sensible precaution. For those of us my spouse is actively is still actively engaged in patient care. She wears an N95 mask. If there's any indication that the patient um, may have been exposed to COVID-19, if that's in question, she wears an N95 mask. I hope that helps. But I also tell you, I can't give you definitive guidance. Some of this is dictated by your facility policy and guidance from groups like the CDC, OSHA is involved in this, but I, I am positive that ARN and ISHAM have very current information in this area. And in future presentations for today from, uh, from the 3M speakers, Kimberly Prinson, Susan Flynn, and Larry Talapa, there will be downloadable resources specific to N95 or processing. So certainly tune in for those sessions and take advantage of those resources. Uh, Jim, the next well, question that came through is, do you have any plan for third world countries and outreach in countries like India or other countries around the world from CCI's perspective? So CCI, CCI has a worldwide presence. We are the largest. Um, we are the largest certification organization for nurses that works in that work in the operating room in the world. And any nurse who is willing to take the exam in English, because we we have never translated our exam is um, eligible and welcome to engage in our certification and all that's involved in that. So I would tell you any nurse who participates in our education gains access to our learning management system. So if, you, um, if you're if you certified with us, we give you access to a wide variety of education, some of it done in partnership with Beyond Clean, all of those materials are available to you. Specific programs in any given country, India, Pakistan, I am open to that. So um, I would say, Lindsay, if you, um, if you have access, and with the person that asked that question, if you would like to share my contact information, my email, I would be glad to engage and talk about specifics about um, what CCI can do. You know, we, we okay. do certification and we engage in education. We have a lot of resources and a lot of partnerships. I would love to discuss what we can do, um, what we can do to assist in 
in uh, deploying our strengths and our resources, we um, we can certainly fund research, and it's a competitive process. But I would have to know more about the specifics. I did note that in your registration list, you have uh, people attending this conference from all over the world, um, and that is a great thing that we can come together and share ideas because we don't um, we don't have all the answers in the United States, and healthcare is delivered differently around the world. So feel free to share my information with the person that asked that question, and then we can follow up. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, the next question that came through is, would you rather advocate for licensure versus certification as a minimum requirement to the profession? And there's a follow-up question to that as well, but let's start with that. <laughs> okay, let's get to that quickly. I believe each of those could help address the issue of competency. I think the the quickest, the most effective route is to deal with it through certification. Most of the certification bodies are nonprofit entities. We um, we are not bound by um, what lawmakers in a particular state, Colorado, Texas, Connecticut, et cetera, we're not bound by that. So, for example, if we were to change requirements and say you needed a higher level of education, you need to do more to earn a certification and keep it, we could do that quickly. And we could respond to our stakeholders if they say we want additional requirements, we want you to provide more resources to the certificates, we could do that far more quickly than a licensing body could. But licensing bodies and certification bodies, each of those could address this. For those that have the will and the resources like CCI to do it, we can do that quickly and we are already beginning to do that. All right, the follow-up question, and I think I know what you're gonna say. The follow-up is then using certification for validation of competency and expertise like RNs and MDs. Yes, the, the mechanism and how we do this, this is part of what we study at CCI, at the Research Foundation. The mechanism to do that is already known. What is missing is the willingness collectively to do it. And um, if that, I can share resources if people want information, but how to assess competency that is known. The difficulty is getting everyone that's involved, the people that hold your certification free, that they want to take part and uh, expend the the system that addresses that. We don't have consent. Certification can help you do that. In both certification and recertification, we can help you do that. And that is the general direction we're moving in, but um, there's a clear consensus that everyone, particularly every single certificate, wants to do that. There are some people doing great work in certification, and I will single out Isham here. Isham does a wonderful job. They have very strong accredited programs, and um, they're, they too are moving in that direction because they have the same accreditation bodies that we do um, in perioperative nursing. I love these questions, so let's keep going. All right, next one, is CCI developing new certification currently? We are. I, I think the rumors are out. When we did the live presentation in Minnesota, um, I spoke to this. CCI is currently developing a new credential for ambulatory surgery. Right now, it's only for nurses, but we are going to specifically address ambulatory surgery because it's different than surgery that's done in a, um, in a hospital. 
Ambulatory surgery is somewhat different. It's not a wholesale difference, but there is a demand for a separate certification, and we are developing that. Also, in the near future, within two to three years, you can expect that CCI will begin to offer certifications that are available to nurses, but also to other healthcare disciplines. Likely, those would be things like management credentials. That is entirely possible within two to three years. And that would be open to people that supervise central processing, nurses that are in management leadership roles that uh, don't hold a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, and other healthcare professions like healthcare administrators or people that are engaged in supply chain management. You can expect that from CCI in two to three years. And as always, we will strive to have those be accredited programs, but that is in our future um, to engage with other healthcare disciplines so that they too can have access to our certifications. And Lindsay, is now a good time to talk about certificates of mastery and now is a great time. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. For central processing professionals, here's the, the big reveal. Uh, CCI in the year 2020 will begin working with Beyond Clean to develop new credentialing offerings. We call them micro-credentials and certificates of mastery. In 2021, I am confident you will be able to earn a micro-credential and an accredited certificate of mastery in a sterile processing related topics. And those programs will be developed jointly between Beyond Clean and CCI. And the educational materials to support those will be hosted in the learning management system that CCI uh, owns. So that too is coming. Let's be realistic. I think you will see these credentials. That's a whole different conversation, but those sorts of credentials, certificates of mastery and micro credentials, you can expect to see those in 2021. And those will be a joint offering in partnership with Beyond Clean. All right. Thank you, Jim. Another question that did come through, and from Beyond Clean's perspective, we are very excited to partner with you uh, in developing those micro-credentials. Can you give just a brief background about the difference between certifications, for example, the CRCST uh, that you would obtain through ISHM or the CBSPD credentials and the micro-credentials and certificate of mastery that you would, you'll soon be able to obtain through CCI and Beyond Clean? Okay, so the big overall term is credentialing. A division of credentialing, you have certifications, and those are the two that you just mentioned from the two other well-respected accrediting, um, accredited credentials. You just mentioned two for central processing. Relatively new are micro-credentials. Those are very specific bits of learning, and those could be for CCI things, topics like strategic management or financial management, smaller, more digestible things. Currently, there's no accreditation program for micro-credentials, but they meet a need for lifelong learning. <laughs> they are not certifications. And micro-credentials and certificates mastery you don't get initials after your name. They are additional education and training. Certificates of mastery can be accredited. And CCI, our goal in working with our partners is to develop micro-credentials, certificates of mastery, and those certificates of mastery can be accredited. 
by some of the same bodies that accredit our certifications, but the difference is smaller, uh, different bodies of knowledge that aren't as um, aren't as comprehensive as what is covered in certification. So um, that's kind of the big overall picture. Credentialing is the big umbrella. We have certifications, micro credentials, certificates of mastery. Micro credentials, certificates of mastery are relatively new. All right, Jim, and we are out of time. There were quite a few more questions we didn't get to, so what we're going to do is um, send those directly to Jim so he can answer those on a one-off basis. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. Um, Jim, thank you so much for kicking off the Beyond Clean virtual conference. And uh, everyone, we will look forward to seeing you at 9.30 Eastern for 10 Reasons Why with Bob Mars. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.